Hello everyone, my name is Carl. This is Filling It In by Bulag Bandit Media. Today I have a special guest and uh, I'll let them go ahead and introduce themselves. Hi guys, I'm Sharice Leanne Kakuyorin and I'm um, a third year student at University of Hawaii Manoa. I am double majoring in Philippine Language and Literature and Human Development and Family Studies. And I'm super excited to be with you all today. All right. So that's actually one of the, that's how we met, right? Through um, Tita Pia's class. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that class is very, I guess, informative for me because especially when I grew up here, I never really heard about the things that we talked about. I mean, partially, but kind of on the margins, I guess, is the way that I'd explain it. So talk to me about like, how did you get to the double major phase? Yeah, so for my freshman year, my one of my friends was taking an IP class. So that's um, just a pop culture class. And I also was looking for a work-study job. There was one from the Ilocano department, and I decided, like, okay, this is going to be fun. I get to work in the Ilocano department and be able to sit in a Filipino class just for fun. Then when I was grading papers... I was reading the work and I was reading all the resources, like the materials that we were giving out in class. And I was like, wow, this is actually really interesting. So I started taking IP classes. I just was so fascinated by how much I did not know about the Philippines and the culture and the history. And so I kept taking more and I had a meeting with, um, Atipia and Kuya Jason, and they recommended that I should just double major since I've been taking classes already for fun. And I was like, "Oh yeah, word. I'm why not? You know." And yep. ever since, <laughs> I just I just loved all my Filipino-based classes, and I'm really happy I get to double major in it. I had the similar experience in terms of I walked in, I was like, "Hey, I don't know about this stuff," because you mentioned. You were in Ilocano. So are you, you're Ilocano? Do you speak Ilocano? I was born in Ilocos Norte, actually. Ayo? But I understand Ilocano. I just don't know how to speak it well. But I'm very fluent in Tagalog. So, yeah. See, that's my problem. I'm originally from Cagayan Valley. where my dad's from. But I do not speak Itawis, Ibanag, or... I think they still speak Ilocano there, too. There's a big Ilocano population. But I don't understand any of them. I like know a couple words. That's about it. <laughs> That's literally me with Ilocano. I can only say thank you. Right. I think the only things I know to say in Ilocano are like nadaka, which means like big, right? Uh, got awan, which means like no more. Or I don't know if it means <laughs> no. I should know no, how to say yes. No more, like. Oh yeah. Ilocano. Okay. Yeah. Like like none. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. See, that's like the only thing that I know how to say. Like, I tried to know as much as possible because I. I learned Tagalog first and I realized there's a whole lot more information to know out there. However, the access to the resources was the problem for me. I actually like I found Spanish copies in in Spanish of like Rizal's work and some other like Filipino scholars when I was in like middle school, oh, high school. Wow. Yeah, but that's a problem. You can't get any of them in original language or it's hard for me to even find at least back then still now language text that's either from like regional languages and tagalog sometimes which is like ooh, yeah that runs me the wrong way the second thing i think you mentioned that was i guess really interesting to me was you said that you didn't know a lot of the stuff how do you deal with that does it frustrate you does it make you angry or like like what happens in the mindset of like shit i don't know Honestly, I went through this whole identity crisis at one point, probably like last year. I was like, how do I not know any of this? And at first, it was mainly because of how moving here at a young age, that's automatically stripped from us. We never had the opportunity because, you know, we're not in the Philippines. And I wouldn't have had that chance until I was here and going to school for it. Even in high school, I haven't learned much about Filipinos at all, like the Filipino culture or the history, especially because my parents don't 
even know it themselves. I'll share anything I learned in class with my mom and she'll be like, oh, I didn't know that. So that shows a lot about how much of our history is really being taught. And it does kind of rub me off the wrong way how I wouldn't have learned any of this if I was getting an education for it. And it makes me sad because there's so many communities here in Hawaii where they don't have access to going to the University of Hawaii and being able to take Filipino-based courses so that they can learn more about their culture. And that's how I'm hopefully being, I hopefully want to be able to provide those resources to more of those in the island who won't have that access to university resources. Exactly. I think that's also one of the reasons why I also criticize the University of Hawaii at a certain extent. For example, like my situation, I came to UH with a two-year degree. So when you come to UH with a two-year degree and you basically have all your GE done, usually what people do to, I guess, do double majors or to minor in something, the usual path is you'll take some of your minor or double major classes while you're doing your GE. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. for example like if you need like a wi class you can do ip 360 for example or 364 yeah. so that you can complete your your gewi requirement yeah that's what i did a lot of people can't afford that especially when they come in with a two-year degree for me i actually initially majored in education i switched to journalism and now i actually switched to filipino because they told me oh by the way you can actually graduate in like three semesters. The journalism program, they just restructured everything. They merged with the School of Communications. They're like, oh yeah, if you wanna graduate with our degree, because we have like this really strict pattern, fall, spring, fall, spring, you have to graduate in 2024. And I'm like, what? Oh my gosh, yeah, no. And if I wanted to double major, like it, it would take even longer because if I wanted to stay on track with that, it would be like, you have to take like three journalism classes. And to double major, usually you need to do three of every major. So I'm like, eh, that's fine. I can do six classes a semester. But because the way that IP works, right? Don't you have to take an IP class plus the 399, which is the like practicum or whatever? Um, I know to graduate with a double major, you're going to have to eventually take 399 from what I know. But these past few years, I've been, I just started with IP 360, then 364 and worked my way up yeah i was looking oh sorry go ahead <laughs> no 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 that's that that was it yeah i was looking at my degree plan the problem with my degree plan i would have to take eight classes a semester oh my god no don't do that to yourself do not do that to yourself i came i came to manoa from a, like a high pressure japanese college and they were like yeah so the way we do it here you graduate with a dissociate's degree in a year and 15 months. Everything is quarters. Your classes are 10 weeks long. You have essays and papers due like every week. Super pressurized. It's insane. Yeah. Which brings me to my next point about, you said you had an identity crisis. Explain that a little bit. If you want, I can, I can go ahead and explain mine if that gives you a little bit more context. Yeah, you can explain yours first. Yeah, okay. For me, my identity crisis was I actually just wanted to be Asian. It sounds really weird, but let me explain. I kind of touched on this in my last video about Filipino culture and the intersections of being Asian. Please check it out. Shameless plug. It's one of my first videos on the YouTube, but I went to a Japanese college because I figured, well, hey, they're Asian too, and they usually get more press and attention so if i go there i will most likely be respected more for my diversity because we're all asian and hey at least i'm not somebody who's like weird or something i kind of understand and get me but the problem there is they didn't and i realized there are these really big differences and separations that we have to mind the gap on there has to be work done to like go forward and back the reason why I started in Filipino because I realized I have to go backwards to get to the part where we mind the gap with other cultures. I have to understand mine before I start to accept and take on another one. 
that's even my problem with a lot of Filipino Americans, Filipino Canadians, Filipino foreigners. I hear this a lot. And it's because we don't know who we are, it's hard to like intertwine and entangle into a new culture and have it be a healthy relationship because at that point you're more one than the other as as opposed to like sharing that identity and having i guess a healthy amount of pride that doesn't get weird and toxic and become like a mess in in your brain what do you think about that that's crazy yeah especially with the way that i was born in the philippines and i grew up there for a little bit and then i had to move to um the united states and everything is different and now i have to now i'm trying to learn a whole nother society like another culture within a new society and it's hard because my parents are traditional so what do i believe in what do i follow i know for sure growing up i would joke around with the filipino accent calling my you know the fob the t- derogatory mm-hmm. term yeah. like i used to ca- like call myself that religiously and point people out for that because it was so normalized and i was just making fun of everything because everyone else was until i grew up and realized like it's it's funny, but at the same time, it's actually really insulting to for especially the more older Filipinos who just moved here. They they don't know any better. They don't know the English language that well. They don't, and they still want to uphold their own traditions, and that should be respected, not not made fun of. You know, Emma. and that. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I was thinking, like, who am I really? Am I ashamed of myself or am I am I just embracing my culture in a funny way? It's it's such a weird concept to grasp in terms of identity, because while I'm here trying to still adapt to the American culture and as well as all the other cultures, because actually all throughout high school, I I was taking Japanese classes, so I I loved integrating into the Japanese culture, and I became more more receptive to other cultures, and that taught me a lot on how we're all so different and so unique. And then I only realized in college where why am I so interested in all these other cultures, and I never really took the time to learn about mine. So that's what really inspired me to be more in touch with my own roots and start back ra- backwards, like what you said. Mm-hmm. That's a that's an, a really important process because I echo the same feelings. Okay, so the the first thing that I thought about when when you were talking there was you're talking about the accent and like being fobs. That I am very guilty of, and I realize now because I'm older and learn more it's harder to see other people's perspective especially when you think that you're the same because you're like oh they're fobs or they're philippine or you know they're they're filipinos too so i i automatically know their experience no i don't maybe my parents would have a really different perspective and they do and i had to think about this big picture a lot of people don't do that though my brother taught me this and it's you know when we have conflicts in my family or whatever and it usually is because of the difference in culture and generation I get stuck so much in like, oh, this is how I want it to be. This is how I think, you know, reality society being. Maybe I'm right sometimes. Maybe I'm not. But that's from my perspective. And I have to like shut my brain down and say, hey, what if I had their brain? Let me, let me like put on their hat or whatever. <laughs> I, I instantly know it's like, oh, that makes more sense now. They were born in this time and this was like the material condition of their era. That's not my experience. I have to learn about that more. That's why I think it's really important to do that backwards learning, like I said. And now that I'm in the classes, it helps my perspective so much more because I'm learning from people who are sometimes in, like in the close proximity to like what they experience. And I can ask questions and be curious and find out because I know my parents sometimes don't like answering questions or some things are weird. 
the other part is when you make fun of them, this is just what I think. It also kind of reminds them of you know a time where those things were done not in really in the unintentional or jest. Like those things were actually insulting. They were meant to demean and dehumanize people. Like I watched a couple movies that were taking place in older eras. And I noticed when people speak a certain way or they they call each other certain things, like that had meaning. I think have you watched the uh, what is that movie now? I think it was on Netflix for a while. Um, Henera Luna. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. Did. You notice in the movie, like they actually call each other like Indios, you know, like the lighter yeah. Filipinos or the actual like the Spanish. They're like, yeah, shut up, Indio, or whatever, right? Like mm-hmm. that's basically like the N word. Pretty yeah. much, yeah. And so when you do the the stuff where you play with the accent, sometimes whatever, that's kind of like harkening back to that era. And obviously, it's not quite the same thing because you're not explicitly saying the thing but Mm -hmm. everybody knows that what you're doing is you're trying to not say the thing while saying the thing that makes sense yeah Yeah, definitely that also kind of brings me to my thought about when you talk about like hearkening back to another time sometimes that's not such a bad thing like for me i actually have somewhat of a filipino accent sometimes especially when i get passionate about something or i stop like actively me too (laughs) yeah like actively I'm going to speak posh and do this thing and that other thing. I had a really big problem in my journalism classes because my professors, they're like watching my my videos and stuff and they're like reviewing my content. The journalism professor goes like, why do you talk like that? I'm sitting here like, talk like what? <laughs> I go back and watch. I slowly am slipping into my Philippine accent. But at this point, I've learned and kind of by experience, because what you were saying earlier about I have to just kind of accept who I am. It's okay to have that accent and it's totally acceptable just because other people don't think so doesn't necessarily make it right. What do you think about that? There's so many different parts of not even just a Filipino culture, but every culture where you're good at certain things and you're not good at certain things, but that doesn't make you any less of who you are like with, exactly right yeah with with um our accents mine comes out every so often and instead of looking at it like oh i can't believe i talked in this accent i realized that the only reason why i thought like that is because we're conditioned to think that having a filipino accent would be unprofessional or not americanized enough you know especially with that colonialist Mm -hmm. mentality even in the philippines they discourage speaking filipino at one point and they wanted to like stop people from doing that that's why everyone is trying so hard to speak english in the best way they can and that's how we all become ashamed of it eventually we have that generational curse of being ashamed which is something that we should start changing now because What's wrong with having an accent? We all have accents. We're all ethnically diverse. It comes out and it shows even more that I have a little bit of that Filipino that comes out of me and we should be unapologetic for that. And it's actually what I'm going to be talking about somewhat in my my paper for our Filipino class. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, If you ever had, have you heard of the Filipino rapper NAK? You got to show me it song or okay, something okay i will after this but nak is he's a filipino american guy uh, i think he's based out of southern california i'm pretty sure that, i know he's from california i just don't know which part i think chino hills is in southern california i think that's near la but he has a song where he's it's basically him monologuing and delivering a letter or i guess like a statement to his family members and he's saying there's there's a couple lines i'm not going to quote them exactly but along the same lines one of the most important ones to me was feeling like I can't love the motherland if I don't speak the language. Never thought I'd be hated on by my own people. This American dream, this freaking whole sequel. What's a blast when all the roots are ashamed of it? I'm hardly processing what the nature is. Though I didn't learn the language of our home, I love it with the language that I know. I'll love my, my country no matter what language I know. 
like no matter which one I speak, I'll still I'll still be pouring out love for like my culture and my country. And then the other thing was like, I think the opening to one of that, that same song was like, it's a it's a person saying like, oh it, here we go. It's it, here I just remembered it. It's she told me, how could you say you're Filipino if you don't speak the Galug? You're a disgrace. He remembered when his family member said that, oh, like you can't speak Tagalog. Well, you're not. You're you're ashamed. You're a disgrace to being Filipino. And there's other themes in that. Not just for not speaking Tagalog. There are other things like, oh, you're you're ashamed or you're a disgrace to being Filipino. And I think that has to stop. One thing I noticed when I talked to my cousins or just people I know from the Philippines, you know, they 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 do you, know, do you ever experience this where they're like, well, in English, English mo ako kalabosino. Oh my God, you're speaking English. Wow, you're such a like a pretentious asshole. You, you ever you ever run into that? Oh yeah, plenty of time. Right, and for us, I think it's kind of normal. But that's another thing people don't remember sometimes on both sides. That hey, a lot of us, for the most part, we don't do it because we intentionally do X, Y, and Z. It's because that's how we're conditioned. Like you said earlier, right? We are conditioned to learn and think a certain way because there's no education. And I guess like a self awareness of we're doing this because there was an intentional decision or emphasis made on something. People don't remember that. Like, how how common do you think your you, that kind of like mentality or situation is? Extremely common. I was getting my brows done last week mm -hmm. with this completely new lady, and I was getting to know her, and she was telling me how she's half Filipino, and she was at work. And she has all of these Filipino um, co-workers who were speaking to each other in Tagalog. And they're talking to her in Tagalog. And she's like, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're saying. And they're like, how do you not know? You're Filipino. Oh, my and, gosh. That's the worst. Yeah. It's like, it's crazy because of she, she wouldn't have any idea because she was born and raised here. Her mom is only half. And even more so she probably wouldn't have been able to teach her because she was she herself was still learning the american culture and now mm -hmm. that she learned it she can't really teach it just like me i know for sure sadly that i won't be able to be as fluent enough to teach my children fluent tagalog unless i speak to them every day but i already myself do not speak every day so i know i wouldn't be able to provide that just like how my parents provided for me. So we just have that lack of cultural competency within each other, especially here. You instantly assume because someone is a certain ethnicity, they would know or not know, you know? And that definitely does have to stop because we should be mindful that we all didn't grow up a certain way or a way that we expect them to just because we share the same ethnicity. Okay, I'm having rapid fire thoughts. I have three things to say here. <laughs> no, go for it. Number one, uh, when you were talking about how, oh, you look Filipino, this, this whole idea, right? Number one, the blood quantum stuff is total BS. Like, you know, people appear a certain way. I think that's a concept that it's kind of still budgeting. It's kind of small still or not that popular where, you know, you, you appear one way, but, you know, to get to know the person and actually you shouldn't make assumptions. You should, you know, talk to them and get to know them. Number two, sorry, the rapid fire thoughts are kicking in. I, this is, this is my problem when, especially when I write, that's why I need outlines when I write because all my thoughts go everywhere a million miles an hour. It has to stop in terms of, oh, I'm just going to go about my day and do this X, Y, and Z this way. And I, I'm just not going to prioritize learning the language or just kind of that kind of thing. Like, like you said, cultural competency. I think that's a really important word. I think not a lot of people know what that is. I hope you can explain it in just a second. Yeah, of uh, course. And then I guess the last thought that I had that was running through me like a million miles an hour was, oh, when you're talking about like half Filipino or partially Filipino, um, it's, people have this idea that if you say that you're half Filipino or whatever, like you shouldn't look more Filipino or like your skin should be lighter or your skin should be different. 
just because you know we're something else in Philippine doesn't mean that it. I feel like the way that they phrase it and it's put, it makes us feel us as in people I've talked to. I don't know how you feel about this, and you can tell me in just a second. But it makes me and people that I've talked to about this feel like we're less Filipino. I get asked the question like, "Oh, you're Filipino American? You don't look white," <laughs> which you know. Mm-hmm. A lot we have to do the education too. Um, I know this. This is not just the Philippines thing too. I went to Japanese college, and um, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm local. I'm from Hawaii, or whatever. They're like, what? I thought only like white people exist in America. This that's all you see on Japanese TV. I think that happens a lot in the Philippines too, because that's the experience that I have when I talk to people that were born in the Philippines and were there for like a long period of their life. But um, go ahead, explain cultural competency and just respond to I guess what I just said. <laughs> I was talking yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's good because I've always wanted to talk to somebody about stuff like this. Like, it's so important for us to learn about co- cultural competency. Actually, in in the pageant, the Miss Philippines Hawaii pageant that I did last night, that was exactly what my platform was about: cultural competency. So the textbook or the Google term for it is cultural competence, also known as intercultural competence, is um, a range of cognitive, affective, and behavioral skills that lead to effective and appropriate communication with people of other cultures. And that basically means when you have a set of values, behaviors, attitudes, and practices within a system, organization, program, or among individuals that enables them to work effectively cross-cultural. So it basically means that we have that mutual respect for each other and we understand that the other person has a different background no matter what culture they're from because although we are made up with different ethnicities, it doesn't mean that we are brought up the same. There's so many factors that come into it, into play when it comes like this, because there are Filipinos who are first generation immigrants, second generation immigrants, and Filipinos who were, whose family has been living here for a long time. So we all were brought up differently and we just got to be able to be mindful, just be mindful that it's not the same as your experience and that you shouldn't assume that someone was going through the same thing as you just because you share the same ethnicity and about your your topic about being filipino enough or not filipino enough or looking filipino it's crazy because i know there's a lot of people out there who who feel like they can't be a part of the Filipino community because they haven't gone through certain experiences. Mm-hmm. And it's sad because you shouldn't have that division, you know, that sort of division where you have to meet a certain experience to be considered a part of your culture. If you want to learn about your own culture and if you want to identify it, identify by it then by all means be proud of it why are we creating a culture why are we creating a society that shames us for it you know i actually saw this one post is it okay if i share it no you're Um, good you're good good. go ahead but it it was really nice to read it was very reassuring especially not especially for me but I know that it would be such a great message to give out to every Filipino out there, Filipinos, Filipino Americans, anyone with even just a little bit of Filipino in them. So it goes like this. You are Filipino enough. No matter the languages you may or may not speak, no matter your stance on Filipinex, no matter the shade of your skin, no matter the fluidity of your gender, no matter your belief in a higher power, no matter if you've ever been to the motherland no matter when you've last been to the motherland no matter where you are in the world no matter where you are in your work to decolonize your mind no matter if and how you're fighting intergenerational trauma 
no matter how many Filipinos tear you down and question the validity validity of your Filipinoness. Gatekeeping another Filipino's desire to connect with our colorful past bears no value other than unnecessary intolerance. There is no one way to be Filipino. If your family has roots in the Philippines, then you're one of us. And ah, oh, I love that so much. What do you think? That I uh, did that is such a short short thing in the, in the grand scheme of things because if you if you've seen anything i've written it that's very short but it's so punchy and gets to a lot of different points like um a couple big ones that i've uh kind of were able to remember from that number one no matter your religion a lot of filipinos forget we have this big thing which is one third of the entire country called mindanao <laughs> right Crazy. yeah the predominant religion was Islam. And we can talk about this later. I actually wrote like an entire, it was actually my, my graduation um, project thesis thing at uh, my co- my former college. And everybody was like, what? I didn't know this. There was actually a, a scholar from Indonesia who was like, what do you mean you guys don't know this? But a lot of people didn't know that one of the biggest entities in Philippine history that controlled majority of the country was the Sultanate of Sulu. And I know that brings up a lot of drama. I won't bring that up. But what I'm saying here is that there is very little representation of that in being Filipino. A lot of people think, oh, all about all it's about is wearing polos, going to Sunday school, and uh, I guess, I don't know, eating lechon kawali, which is like, you know, the biggest haram thing in, in <laughs> for, for Filipino Muslims. They can't do that, right? Eating pig is against the religion. And on that topic... Uh, did you know about the like the petition to add a fourth star uh, onto the Philippine flag? Have you heard of that before? No, I actually haven't. Yeah, there's a there's a four star movement. I think it's been introduced. Um, he's still senator. I forget somebody else introduced it first though. Um, Richard Gordon, um, and they want to add a fourth star to the Philippine flag because, um, I know that's it's controversial because, you know, the part of Borneo that used to be part of uh the Sultan of Sulu, it's under Malaysian control and all of this kind of stuff. I'm not going to get into the drama of that because I feel like that will really like get people's eyes on this in the, in the wrong way, but it is sort of interesting. I, I forget what the exact quote is. There was like a, a person from the BARM, the, like the autonomous region in Mindanao. He was saying, you know, every time I look at this flag, I feel excluded, right? Because there's very little representation. I think they wanted to add even if it's not the fourth star because people have the connotation that it's associated with Borneo, but they wanted to add an extra ray onto the the sun because that would, that would at least represent uh, indigenous people in the south as well as um, Muslim folks in, in Mindanao and the other parts of the south. So it's like they're like the, the post said or if that, that piece of literature or poetry there's gatekeeping going on and it's I, I think it's terrible. I think one of the biggest examples here, have you have you like run into this, especially with like celebrities and athletes where they're they're very liberal in terms of like letting people in, but as soon as as soon as like they they underperform or there's some they do something that they don't like, they they immediately gatekeep their Filipinos. They're like, oh him? Nah, he's only like ex Filipino, X percent Filipino or he only does this. Have you ever run into that before? No, I actually haven't. All right. So, like, yeah, yeah, I'll give you an example. Yeah, yeah. So, like, this happens a lot, in, especially in athletics. If you're, if you're familiar with, like, um, national teams for, for certain sports. Mm-hmm. So, for example, there's this guy named Eric Cray. He runs track for the Philippines. Um, I think he's won multiple awards at, like, the Asian Games and Sea Games. The Southeast Asia. It's like the Southeast Asia qualifier for the Olympics. So this guy, he regularly wins. He he gets medals for the Philippines and whatnot. But he's uh, he's partially Filipino. I think he's uh, African American or um, black of some sort. Um, I have to do my research on that because I'm not really a track. I'm I'm a more of a basketball martial arts kind of guy. But we can get into that in just a second. Eric Craig gets all these awards and stuff, but he never usually makes it to the Olympics. I'm not sure if he's ever made it to the Olympics before. And um, people criticize him, and you know it's like, oh man, this guy. Why is he representing the Philippines? Like he, he sucks, and it's like he's representing oh. the Philippines because he's Filipino. 
<laughs> you know, like yeah. he won the Patafa, like the Philippine uh, Athletic Track and Field Association's bid. You know, all credit to him. Or um, in the PBA, especially the Philippine Basketball Association, which we're actually like the first professional league outside the NBA. Got to like insert that. Um, there's actually like a, a rule. I don't know if they've amended this. I know some other leagues in the Philippines have amended this, but there's rules around like how many Filipinos that are not born in the Philippines or homegrown talents in air quotes. There's a limit on how many of those people you can have on a team. It, like literally excludes folks born in other places. Oh, right. That's tough. Exactly. But everybody seems to think that that somehow is okay. I, I'm not, I'm not following how that's okay. <laughs> And yeah, me neither. it gets all to the point of like people gatekeep the culture and like who gets the label of Filipino and not way too much. And it's literally like a matter of policy now. Do you have Philippine citizenship? I'm curious. Or is that um, too private of information? I'm not sure. No, no. I honestly don't know. I know I'm an American citizen now. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like right now, to my knowledge, Especially because this is kind of a hot button topic because a lot of us are diaspora, right? And many of us, especially if we're born here or we get taken as children, we don't get the choice of what citizenship we get. Mm -hmm. I think like, because you were born there, so you might actually have a very bit easier time getting Philippine citizenship. Um, but, you know, I, I, for example, I don't. Um, this whole like idea of if you want to actually petition for naturalization, do you know how difficult it is to naturalize as a Philippine citizen? Are you aware of the it? process? So to naturalize uh, basically is you get the citizenship of the Philippines without being considered nationally or nationally considered naturally born. So that means either you were born in Philippine soil and you had like your birth registered in the Philippines mm -hmm. or I think it's like you're born to Philippine citizens at the time of your birth. So similar to America's citizenship rules, but not really. Um, for a long time, dual citizenship was completely banned in the Philippines. I think they amended it in the early 2000s under Arroyo. I forget what the Republic Act is. I should know these things. I'm a nerd about it. But they amended the rules. But for a long time, those are the only two ways you could become a Philippine citizen. You had to be born to Philippine citizen parents or you had to be on, born on the soil of the Philippines. Here's the issue, though. The only other way to get Philippine citizenship is to literally get your petition for naturalization passed by the Philippine Congress. Wow. So, okay. yeah, so that's actually how a lot of Philippine athletes, they have something called import players, which I hate the term import players. Like, they're, they're just people from other countries. Like, they're not, they're not a product that's imported. But anyway, a lot of players that represent the Philippines in international sports, they, the reason why it takes so long is because they have to get their naturalization approved by the Philippine Senate and the Philippine House of Representatives. In America, I know that our immigration system has so many pitfalls, and I'm not going to get into that now. At least you don't have to get an entire legislative body, which is busy with a multitude of other different things, just to get your passport. Yeah. That brings me to my point now of, I think that affects the way people view Filipino-ness because, you know, having the passport for some different countries and nationalities, people from those countries usually associate, well, if you have the passport, then you're one of us. I think... America to an extent is that way because we don't really have an indigenous people that America, the country represents. Like, of course we have native Americans and first nations people, but of course the government of the United States, you know, like the, the people in the white house kind of government of the United States, that technically is not what they represent. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not in their interest. So that idea of like Americanness is more. I, I had a great American studies professor. Shout out to um, Professor Ringer. Um, hopefully, you start teaching again. I loved your class. But there's this idea of Americanness, and it's it's more related to like your, like your your mentality and your headspace, right? Would you Would you agree? Yeah, I do. Because like, would you, would you consider yourself American? I guess is the the question. Yeah, to to a certain extent. Honestly, with everything going on, I do not like to really associate myself as an American. Me neither. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's just like, it's, 
one, they don't really care to represent me anyway, like me mm-hmm. and my community anyway. So there's no sense trying to represent them. Okay, but, yeah. See, like that's the okay. That brings up another thing, and I, I think I'm gonna cut short the other part I was talking about because this is important. <laughs> A lot of Filipinos they love America. Would you say this? Would you? Would you, would you have the same assessment? <laughs> oh yeah, especially how Filipinos. There's so many concepts of the American dream, and it it really just all comes down to history and be, and how we just became so colonized into thinking America is, is the end goal and America is that dream place that you, you really want to be in. And it's not even just Filipinos. It, it, it's the Mexicans to the Spanish. A lot mm-hmm. of third world countries think that America is all of this. And, you know, it's really not. You know, I mean, it, we get the mm-hmm. opportunities. We get, we we get the opportunities, but we have to work really hard for that. And it's not even just, in a sense of, being able to have the ability to work here and have that chance to work hard to get what we want, but combating all of the cultural differences that you have to face while being here. Exactly, like working hard. Whatever these people say, oh yeah, work hard, whatever, I'll hustle, I'll grind. <laughs> Sigma male grind or whatever. Like work being able to work hard is actually uh, I think a lot of people this is kind of like a, a concept that doesn't register in their mind, but that's actually a privilege. Mm-hmm. As a person with a disability, like I work hard. But I probably will not be able to work as hard as someone else because of my disability, right? Or, you know, for, for Filipino folks. For example, it's a language barrier, the culture barrier. There's always like that thing of like, oh, you know, you're broke. Well, just drive Uber or whatever. And my dad drives Uber. Some people can't. Like, they don't speak enough English to pass a drive the written driving test. Or they're not good enough at English to be able to communicate with passengers or whatever or do those jobs. Like mm-hmm. being able to work is like legit a privilege. And it wasn't too long ago, and I think it still happens now. It's just very hard to see that there are disparities in the way that people employ, whether it be you know national origin, which is the problem for a lot of immigrants, or just like their the way they they appear and the way that they conduct themselves because it's you know it's culturally different and somehow that's supposed to affect their employment, but or their 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 right to work because people should really have like a right to work like seriously. Um, <laughs> with all this going on it's a lot of drama but anyways the whole problem with doing that is it like you said it, it's just really drawing back to colonialism and it har- it, like we were saying earlier it harkens back to a time when things like this were more overt and way more hurtful and it probably it probably doubles back like you were saying earlier you mentioned intergenerational trauma that, that's so true do you, do you think do you like do you think you have any um thoughts on like how people kind of like let the idea of intergenerational trauma lapse because I feel like I feel like that happens a lot. Oh, definitely. With how everything is in the Philippines, everyone is just they have their own mindset on so many things and their beliefs so it just carries on and in the last few generations because these beliefs were so strong they don't really care much to change anything about it like maybe they might but deep down they still act the same way just like how it might get a i don't know if it's a little too personal for this but now go go ahead yeah like my grandma and my mom don't get along well, mm-hmm. especially with the way that they both grew up. Because my grandma was actually, um, she was an old W, so overseas, um, what is F? Filipino. Overseas, <laughs> oh my gosh. Dang, <laughs> oh my it? God. Filipino or, oh my gosh. Oh my, okay. <laughs> don't Are take, no, I'm just kidding. That. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> just pretend that didn't Filipino happen. Filipino worker. Um, 
that's the thing. Like, there are so many communities in the Philippines where they think being an OFW is the only choice to be able to provide for your family. And that's how it was for her generation. But for my mom's side, she thinks that she was abandoned and she she didn't really understand that concept. And mm. the way that trauma is being passed down is she thinks she has to be extremely involved in my life and to be nitpicky of every single uh-huh. thing that I do uh-huh. to show me that she is very involved in my life and she refuses to not be a part of it because or even let me branch out on my own because because that's something that she never had growing up and being when i was younger of course i didn't understand that at all i'm just like thinking oh no i'm controlled i am manipulated Mm -hmm. that's how you view it right yeah that's how i used to view it and now that i'm looking back at it it's really just everyone is trying to process their own trauma and trying to make it different and since we don't really have much education on how to deal with this trauma it sometimes comes off the wrong way and yeah it's just really enlightening to be able to see how that how i'm seeing all of this now and me being able to learn for myself that now we have the resources to actually stop that exactly share that. yeah one thing i thought that was really important because the analogy is somewhat similar to like my experience. I don't think my parents realized, I didn't realize for a long time that because they were working so much, my, my dad literally works overnight. My mom is gone all the same time that I'm gone because she works or she used to work out of school. And I didn't realize the older, like, Hey, you know, the whole, a concept of like latchkey kids or whatever like i wasn't really necessarily that latchkey kid because my parents were like super overprotective of me and they don't want me to leave the house but the idea of latchkey kids that is a trauma like that is something that we care that we carry with us the people who have that experience and it sucks because again going back to there's like a there's a knack song an ak song where he says you know my daddy had to go on a the tour on a ship and my mom you know, say she's going to be late to stuff and stuff like that. Basically, my experience, like my parents tried really hard to be there. And my dad even said that the reason why he worked overnight was so that he could spend time with us. But I mean, the reality of that is even though he was around more, doesn't mean that he was around enough. And I'm not saying that that's his fault. I'm actually blaming that on the system because he needed to make money and money wasn't so much a pain in the ass to get. Then, you know, we wouldn't be in this situation. Um, Like majority of my life, like, you know, I, I know how to cook. I know how to do X, Y, and Z. I'm very independent. Why I'm independent and why I am the way I am? Because I needed to figure that out on my own. Or like with my brothers, <laughs> you know? Like we had yeah. to figure that out. When people say like, wow, you talk very mature or whatever. This happened a lot, especially when I was like younger too. They would say mm-hmm. like, wow, you talk very mature. Like you, my, my auntie used to call me like baby the mula. Like, wow, you, <laughs> you, you, you talk just like an adult, even though you're, you're a kid. And it's like, the reason why is because I was like basically forced to grow up early. People say, well, you know, it's not so bad, but it also means that there's a big division and like a big like lack of experience other people have in comparison to me. So when I got to like college or whatever, a lot of the people that I went to college at my original like Japanese college they were like leagues behind me. I don't want to like like humble brag or like self brag or whatever. I don't want to toot my own horn. But like there were people who were like looking at me like, whoa, what the fuck? He's he's excuse me. He's washing dishes. I had I had like three people behind me one time. I'm in like the public know. dorm kitchen and they're like, yo, you're washing your own dishes? No way. Out of college? <laughs> yeah, no, because um, especially because the college I went to, like a lot of rich kids go to it because it's an international school. So, um, oh. you know, those folks, they have a big lack of experience. I'm like, I've been doing this since I was like 10 years old. <laughs> That's so funny. Right. And like when you say that, like, you know, it sounds completely normal to you. Like you said, like in college, right? 
It sounds completely normal to you, but to some people, it really isn't. And it goes back to how you were saying earlier with the cultural competency. There is a huge gap in communication. And part of that issue is the education. And as like a, as like a midpoint, because obviously education is part of the process, which there's a big lack, but you know, there's other components to the cultural competency, right? Even just getting that part right, education, right? That one singular topic amongst this like field of others would do so much more. And that's exactly what we see today. What experiences like you were brought up earlier, the experiences I talk about with washing dishes and another funny story, somebody put laundry uh, in the laundry machine, they put uh, dishwash soap and then the bubbles started coming out of the washing machine. <laughs> no ways. Yeah, no, I was freaking out. I was, I was like, yo, there's bubbles coming out of this. What did you do? Did you break it? But uh, yeah, they didn't know that you, you couldn't do that. That's the thing. When we have these huge gaps of communication and you don't fill in, <laughs> fill in, you don't get the mid parts done first. There's no way that whatever comes out of your mouth or the ideas that you espouse will make sense because there isn't their prerequisite, which I hate that word now because of UH. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like seriously, F the UH system, Alima is garbage. Um, just put everything on star. Anyways, <laughs> I, could, I could go on about a million years on that. Uh, but returning back, because the resources, we have them now as people who live in a global north country, quote unquote, even though our, our shit's like falling apart. I'm not gonna lie. We live in a global north country that has a little bit more resources. People, I think, do you think people don't think or do people think that there's there's these huge barriers to this kind of thing and that you know building another power structure or building another like set of resources is like a very difficult thing that's like almost like pie in the sky would you say that would you, would you agree or no yeah i definitely agree i feel like especially with everything that we're learning we should definitely try to at least build a curriculum on these different cultures in, in our schools here but even just thinking about that how hard would it be to do something like that especially since it's it's already what almost 2022 and no one's done it yet so it must be a super difficult process since no one's even actually attempted to do so yep i think what california and a couple other states have been trying to introduce cultural studies or uh what is that called? Uh, ethnic studies into their curriculums. There's so much pushback. Like there's this whole debate about critical race theory or whatever. Not exactly too well versed in what they exactly mean by critical race theory because there's a lot of race theories that are critical. <laughs> uh, I would need to like, you know, every, every place's definition of what their curriculum is going to be is different because of the way that American schools are not centralized or whatever. Um, it's, it's probably different, different state to state, uh, county to county, but especially in Hawaii, I know I heard of, there's a, there's an Instagram account. Uh, it's like a group of people who are trying to introduce Filipino curriculum in schools. Have you seen them before? I think you might. Following them. I tried to, yeah. I really want to be a part of that too, honestly. Yeah. I, I, so, I, I, I tried. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. That, that's all I'd say. Yeah. See, we're really excited about this. This is important. Yeah. Uh, I tried to signal boost them a couple of times, but yeah, it's so important to introduce that kind of stuff. I think um, I'm blanking on her name. I think it's the 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 person from the library that did Ubo Folk. You, who is it? The the whole thing with Dilog. Were you there for that day? Was that were you, were you there on Friday for Ubo Folk or no? Did you go on Thursday? I went on Thursday. Oh, okay. So on Friday there was a person who tr who did this thing. Where they had a video, I think I showed. I think I shared it in our in our project thing before. But it's the whole like Adobe Illustrator thing where they made a video that summed up like a Filipino folk story, right? Mm -hmm. And made it, I guess, like palatable for for kids in middle school or high school or something like that. To have something like that in schools is, I think, is really important because it shows that there's like a rich, deep history. Because what's like the typical view that? indigenous people or just kind of like people from different countries aside from 
what is considered the West, you know, the civilized people. Like, what are what are like the perspectives that usually get told? Based on, like, like, like what we learn in school. Oh, it's just, it's all surface level. Mm-hmm. You never get deep into it. It's probably like what a one week unit or one day unit, and then we move on to the next. Exactly, and. I mean, even if you want to like get into it, Hawaiian history or like Hawaiian culture, or whatever. At my high school, I think it's kind of similar in other places. From what I heard, I think you only get one semester on it. Yep. It's like then, what? Yeah. Um. For example, my my high school never had any kind of history that was like even representative of anywhere aside from like the West. The only AP history class we had was AP European history. Like, I, I took the class because I'm a history nerd, but for like 90% of everyone else, I don't think they gave up. Beep. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the problem we have in schools. Yeah, like, there's no parody. Like, I'm not saying that we shouldn't learn European history. I'm sure there's things that you can learn from European history. But, the fact that there's no parody there where you're like, oh, we'll have history of like blah, 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 whatever place. Like, it was so fascinating to me that when I got to college, like you were saying earlier, oh, we can learn about different things in the world. That's crazy, bro. Yeah, that's why when I was looking at all the classes at UH, I was like, wow, this is great. And another thing is, where do you go high school? Ah, ha 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 that's a very hawaii thing but <laughs> i went to baldwin on maui okay so at my high school in waipahu we actually um, i'm not too sure about other high schools but we had at least seven different languages to choose from to learn because we have that um, mm -hmm. graduation requirement to take two years of language yep. we had hawaiian we had tagalog we had um Spanish, of course. We had Samoan, um, Japanese. That because that's what I took. Chinese. We had these different cultures, and I'm super grateful that we had that opportunity to have such variety in what we want to learn about. And it's a requirement for us to, mm -hmm. anyway. And I, yeah, huge props to our principal at the time, Mr. Hayashi, who's now a part of the DOE, which is awesome. So he could probably, hopefully, share that as well. But that's something that I was really proud of when it comes to my high school was the fact that we did value a lot of that intercultural mm -hmm. um, education. And we would have culture days where everyone sets up booths and we get to like it's a requirement for us to have like a presentation and then we get to share food and we get to just learn about other cultures and it's so important for us to have something like that everywhere especially not in just high schools but but elementary schools too mm -hmm. and middle schools and it's yeah Going back to how Hawaii, Hawaiian classes are one semester and then we're done. It's like we are in Hawaii where the are, Hawaiian people are from. Yeah, right? We're, like, oh my God. We're considered the melting pot of the Pacific Ocean. So why are we just not teaching each other about all of these different cultures when we are around all of these different cultures every day, you know? Well, I, I guess from the perspective of education, um, especially in Hawaii, like there the have you heard of the the the, the prison or school to prison pipeline? Mm -hmm. Like that's very much a a part of it. But the other part too is the issue that most education systems, especially the one that I see in Hawaii, is this is actually also the reason why I uh, dropped out of the College of Education at UH. 
they just want you to, you know, teach off the curriculum and, you know, just follow that straight to the point, whatever. I don't agree. One of the things that I never got taught was the social skills and like the, the aspect of, hey, how do I get students to be interested in learning? Because my parents were actually teachers. And mm-hmm. one thing that I really learned is you have to get somebody interested in learning. The Part of the role of a teacher in general, doesn't matter what, what you're teaching. Especially I learned this in martial arts too. It doesn't matter what you're teaching. You have to get the person in love with learning. Right. And that's what I am. My parents got me to do that. I can sit down in front of a book and, you know, granted I have nothing else to do. I will chew up a 300 book, 300 page book in one day. Wow. Right? Like that's not something that they teach you in, in the college of education. I, mm-hmm. I, I think they will say they do, but the reality is that it's not the case. Part of a big emphasis on getting people interested in general is you have to get people interested in learning who they are because that's probably the easiest way. And what you were saying with languages, there's a saying to speak to somebody's ears, not their heart is to speak to them with their, their native language or their, their, the language of who they are. Those languages that they had that you listed off of Samoan, Tagalog, that's representative of who a lot of the students in Hawaii are, right? We have Pacific mm-hmm. Islanders, we have Filipinos, we have Japanese people, we have Chinese people, right? It will get people interested in going to school and learning because they can learn their language. And the missing component now is culture, right? Or history or other, you know, social studies, right? That's what's missing. My high school, we had what? Spanish, Japanese, and Hawaiian. But again, your school was cool because they required it. Our school, it was required with air quotes. But what you could do was, instead of taking the language, you could take art. Oh. So they, no. they, didn't, they didn't separate it where like you have to take art and a language or like you have to take a language on its own as its, as its sole thing. They made it to where you can switch between art or like a, like a creative class. So you could take like ACOM or something instead of having to take a language. So there are literal people out there that probably graduated high school from my high school and other high schools in Hawaii where you just didn't even learn another language. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Yeah so sad like how do you not do that and it's because yeah we don't make them want to and i think it's so important to encourage people to to want to learn about not even just other cultures but especially their own themselves yeah yeah that's the easiest way to rope somebody in hey i'm gonna tell you all about you like people love to be the main character of their story. I mean, that's how most people view their life. I'm the pro tag. I do everything right. My shit don't stink. Right. <laughs> that's how a lot of people view their life. And especially in America with this very individualistic mindset, to a certain extent, that's also how we're programmed to think. Now, the way that we have to, you know, continue to keep things in balance is we have to like counter that in terms of like, hey, we have to be culturally aware, which is not necessarily individualistic because it means you have to delve into community and you have to delve into other people, which you know comes into conflict with the entire way that we're taught to think, the entire system that we're brought up in. That's why I think we should have classes like that because it helps us navigate those conflicts and contradictions because honestly america is like a floating like tanker ship full of just contradictions it's just so weird like i'm not saying oh we should just blow up america or whatever uh (laughs) i'm just saying we have to you know dig up the where the bodies are buried and you know have the trial you know we gotta we gotta we gotta figure this out you know (laughs) Like, yeah, dig up where the bodies are buried. Do the investigation, right? Um, and that's just, just something that's we're not doing right now. It's it's simply just something that we're not doing. And that's why I think advocacy and the things that you do are so important. And that's why we're doing this right now. So I want to thank you for your time. Do you want to plug anything before I, I, I um hit the outro? Uh yeah, actually it I do wanna just agree with you one last uh-huh. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
when we're more culturally aware, just like what you said, America is filled with all of these controversies and everyone is just so lost in translation with each other. And it's because we're not culturally competent enough to be able to understand each other. And I think that's the biggest problem here is because we don't have that skill, we don't work well with each other in the workplace. We don't have the ability to reach our full potential in sharing our own ideas to create those good ideas to advance our nation forward. And I feel like it just starts with that small step of learning about ourselves and being able to be receptive to other people with backgrounds that could really make a huge difference in how our future is going to be. Yeah, I'm just going to edit an explosion there, like, boom. <laughs> that was uh, uh, that <laughs> exclamation point on that, for sure. And uh, so, yeah, any anything you want to plug social media wise or whatever, any projects? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Not into any projects yet. I would love to be a part of them. So if you're watching this and you do have a project, definitely reach out because I would love to be a part of it. I would love to use my own personal platform to boost it. I just, we need to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And even if our platforms aren't as huge and influential yet, it all starts here and now and what we want to do at the moment. And yeah. So right. you can follow me on Instagram. <laughs> Carl will add it on to here. I'll, yeah, I'll add it in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll hold it up. And I do plan on actually joining a lot more pageants. So that I have that title and platform to push this issue because I believe it's so important. So you guys can keep an eye out for that. And I would love all the support I can get because this is, yeah, this is important. And this needs to be addressed and have everyone be aware of it. Indeed. Indeed. That, that is so true. We need the big brain energy work being done. And, um, Sometimes I feel like a monkey brain, but we get it. We get it figured out. <laughs> we get it figured out. Well, anyways, um, thank you so much for listening, guys. Uh, have a good one. Barami salam sa inyo. Since then, I never quite felt Filipino, but at the same time, I never felt fully American. I know who I am. Dear Dita. Let's open discussion. We approaching the truth and we all hoping to touch it. Been a long time coming cause I'm concerned we got separated. The virgin won't get us any closer to summit. I remember that chilly night back in Chino. He told me I'm disgracing us Filipinos. Cause I was never taught, I couldn't speak the Tagalog Though we share the same blood, Rizal, Alguinaldo God knows I try to beat the anguish Feeling like I can't love the motherland if I don't speak the language Never thought I'd be hated on by my own people This American dream, this freaking whole sequel What's a blossom when all the roots are ashamed of it? I'm hardly processing what the nature is Though I didn't learn the language of our home I love it with the language that I know this is all I know Deep Though the islands assemble as a whole shun me I never felt them accepted up in my own country Even my label of Asian often brought in a question I feel a hard disconnection when talking complexion While you pointing fingers, you can't grasp what's happening while avoiding splinters Similarity can trick you, better know the difference Of no identity and no identity I take history to support the inference Lapu Lapu propaganda movement Revolution Bonifacio the Gatipunan I'm the proudest descendant of every insurrection You won't see me defensive, I won't Live to tell it. I was built for resisting all of your vain oppression. I am not coexisting with all your plain rejection. I'm no less than the very thing you claim to be. My identity, something you'll never take from me, dear Dita. I wanna think that it's deeper than words I didn't learn. 
Maybe all of it's swelling up from a deeper hurt Maybe all the betrayal we suffered ain't addressed Maybe grudges ain't laid to rest You can't throw mud upon another, not making a mess I wanna fight back, but I'm saving my breath I check vast ocean, we crossed them now out to wander Cause the cause of it probably is lost in the water Maybe you're sleeping, creeping in the deep end Or maybe a story just isn't complete yet Whatever it is, maybe finding the problem Ain't as vital as finding God trying to solve them So I will keep the repercussions Stay awake, no one sleep the reaper cousin The seed I clutch is the destiny that I can't retreat from That'll blossom, I promise, I'm talking Sampa Gita It's in the words I never say Discovering who we are is accepting destiny while admitting to not knowing where we're going. Direction is just as important as destination. Maybe identity is bigger than past, present, or future. Maybe it's all three together. But I hope this letter finds you well. And P.S. Maybe our story is still being written. <laughs>